So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NITEX CHPC, oh, CHPC, NITEX, NITEX, CHPC Summer School, the, the lecture series part. Uh, today we start the third uh, course yeah, on um, machine learning for bioacoustics. Yeah? This is a really interesting uh, topic. And we are very lucky to have Dr. Emmanuel Dufork uh, with us. Um, he's uh, based in, in, in Stellenbosch. I'm not sure where, where he is at the moment, <laughs> but he's based in Stellenbosch. At least he's in Zoom. Yeah? And, um, and he's going to be with us for, 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 uh, for the next two weeks and give us uh, an interesting demonstration or application uh, of machine learning to problems that involve uh, uh, wildlife, or if I can say so, Emmanuel. Yeah, so it's sure. a really interesting, uh, interesting topic that uh, should be close to the heart of all of us in, in South Africa and, and in Africa and the rest of the world. Yeah, but you're all here to listen to Emmanuel, not, not to me. So please, uh, Emmanuel, if you would like to, to share your screen, you're, you're most welcome. I will now pin you down so that you always appear on the, on the screen. Here you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is Emmanuel Dufork. Thank you, Emmanuel, for being us this morning. I know that you are a very busy person at the moment, so we are really appreciate uh, you being with us. Okay, you're sharing the screen. Um, you're welcome to, to start. I will let in the people that are in the waiting room now. Thank you, Emmanuel. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'll, I'll just fill in the blanks a little bit. Um, so I wanted to do that myself. Um, so I, I'm originally from uh, Mauritius and um, I came here in 2008 and um, I studied at UKZN and uh, at UCT. And my background is primarily in applied mathematics and um, computer science. Um, and that's primarily what I did my PhD in. And then um, something that struck me after my PhD is that I wanted to no longer just focus too much on theory developments of computer science, but see, can we use all these interesting things that we're learning about in computer science and apply it to something that's important? And the there's many important topics, um, but the one that felt necessary to me was uh, related to to um, ecology. So I did my postdoc um, in this particular topic, uh, machine learning for passive acoustic monitoring, and uh, so that was two years, um, and and now. Um, um, I'm a junior research chair at Ames and, and focusing purely um, on, on this. Um, so we've we've actually just uh, started a, a, a small research group at uh, Stellenbosch at the School for Data Science and Computational Thinking um, to you know to to get people um, to work on this and and the and the reason for doing this and and the reason for this particular, why I wanted to present on this area is because there are a lot of people in machine learning and there are a lot of people in ecology, but there are not a lot of people who cross the bridge between ecology and machine learning. So this is what I'm hoping to convey uh, in this first talk to just discuss um, why it's important to have this, this bridge between the two fields and then for the remainder of our time together, we'll work towards understanding a little bit of how we can actually um, get there and do this ourselves. Okay, so I'll start off with this little um, screenshot that I took from uh, the WWF report in 2020. So this is the, the Living Planet report and um, every year or so, they have a new Living Planet report, so you should really take some time and, and look into this. Um, it's very easy to, to read, it's a lot of pictures. Um, so, but this is a screenshot that I took from the 2020 report. Um, it says an SOS for nature. The evidence is unequivocal. Nature is being changed and destroyed by us at a rate unprecedented in history. 
the 2020 Global Living Planet Index shows an average 68% uh, fall in population of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish between 1970 and 2016. So that's that's quite a drastic drop. Um, so you know, so my question then is, you know, who who's going to answer this SOS? And there are a lot of people, ecologists and, and, and conservation and people working to to and and generally a lot of people who are working on this problem but um i think that we can all play um a role in this and um i'm going to try to convince you um how everyone actually on this call can play a small role towards helping um with respect to um biodiversity and um acoustics research um so uh, originally, this talk had two main parts where it was about um, classification and object detection, but the object detection part does not really fall within the world of acoustics. Um, the object detection would be more applicable in the area of machine learning for um, detecting animals in pictures and camera traps, for example. Um, so there, there are researchers who put out these little camera traps in nature and uh, you know they're interested in building machine learning models that can automatically find um, endangered species, for example, and, and do th these kind of studies. But this talk won't focus on this and um, we're going to focus on classification, um, which I'll explain the differences. And then we'll end with some future directions and hopefully here I can convince you that actually everyone in, in this meeting can play a small role. So the, the two, well, there's many machine learning areas, but two very popular common ones right now are classification and detection. So classification is about trying to see if something is in an image. So, for example, here we're asking, we're saying that an Egyptian goose is in this image on the left. Classification is about trying to put things into buckets. Is, is this picture a cat? Is this picture a dog? Um, is this sound um, a gray heron? Is this sound um, a Cape Robin? So we're trying to classify things into different categories, whereas object detection is about saying we're trying to find multiple things within an image. So object detection, we might say, here's the location of a dog in, in the red bounding box. Here's the location of another dog in the green bounding box. And um, here's the location of a cat in the blue bounding box. So essentially, it's, it's two different problems. And the machine learning techniques that we will do to solve these two problems are, are different. Um, and um, for this series, our time together, we will focus on classification. So how can we think of machine learning and classification with respect to ecological questions? Um, because it, it, I mean, it's, it's great to do machine learning, but fundamentally, um, in this area, we're trying to solve an ecological problem. We're trying to solve um, something that uh, an ecologist or a, um, someone in conservation or uh, in a nature reserve, they might have a particular problem or a question or a hypothesis. And, and we will use, we want to use machine learning to try and, and help that. So one question, for example, that someone might ask is, um, does an image um, contain an endangered animal. So if we have um, cameras, you know, um, at a particular nature reserve, and there are some endangered species, we want to know, can we use machine learning to find whether or not that particular animal has come uh, in front of the camera? Similarly, we could do the same with sound. We could say, does this sound clip contain the calls 
uh, which we also refer to as uh, vocalizations of a particular animal. So did um, this endangered animal um, vocalize next to the microphone? So now this is quite a simple question, right? So in theory, um, answering this for one camera or one microphone is a, is a fairly simple question. But the nice thing of this is we can scale this um, quite um, significantly. So we could say which camera detected the endangered species or which microphone um, heard the sound of the endangered species. So now we can do a spatial analysis. And this is what happens quite a lot in practice is we will deploy um, microphones and, and I'll show you pictures of what they look like. We'll deploy them in a particular grid arrangement. Um, they could be, you know, eight or they could be 100 of them. So now we can do a spatial analysis of where sounds of particular species are originating from. Um, are there patterns? Um, um, maybe some of the endangered species have a particular home area and we want to track if the home area is moving. So there's a lot of spatial related things that we could do just from this first simple question and scaling it to multiple um, hardware devices, multiple cameras or multiple microphones. Um, now, of course, um, within the realm of endangered species, this is important. So, so we want to say, does did the microphone hear the vocalization of an endangered species? Um, of course, least common species, least concerned species are not um, as critical, we could say. Um, endangered species are more critical to study. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit more on, on that. Um, and we can also uh, um, answer this kind of question with the classification problem. We can say, given some videos, um, is the species encountering enough prey? So for example, if we attach a camera um, to an animal, actually um, one of our master's students um, had a project where uh, we had a camera attached to uh, a penguin and um, the student was tasked to build an algorithm which could um, classify the type of prey that the camera was seeing. So um, um, penguins, um, um, eat jellyfish. So um, we were trying to see, can we detect all the jellyfish that the penguin is encountering um, so that we can build models that can estimate the amount of energy that the penguin um, uh, burns through. And we can also build models to detect using classification to see if the, if the penguin has um, consumed the, the prey. So then we can have calories um, consumed and calories burnt, and then we can try to predict the survival of, of the species. So there's lots of very interesting and critical questions that can be asked um, when we bring in machine learning into the world of, e of ecology. Um, okay, so let's focus on um, a particular case study. So this was my first project uh, as a postdoc. Um, a few years ago, um, and it was on the Heinen gibbon uh, vocalizations. So the Heinen gibbon is the world's rarest primate. There are around um, 33 individuals, and they are located in Baowangling Nature Reserve, which is just off the coast of China. It's on the, the Hainan Island. And on the left, um, there's a, a picture of a female Hainan gibbon, and on the right is a male Hainan gibbon. And um, these are con considered as um, critically endangered based on the IUCN red list. And I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, so I just want to mention that um, when I started on this project, um, the, the researchers had collected um, about six months worth of data. Um, and that was around 1.5 terabytes of, of raw audio data. So of course, you can imagine that 
manually processing, <clears throat> I think it was about 6,000 hours. Um, no human or team of humans can process 6,000 hours of audio correctly. Um, it, it's extremely time consuming, it's, it's exhausting. Um, so we need to, to, to build a machine learning algorithm that can automatically go through all of these 6,000 hours to try and find um, where in the files the gibbon is calling so that we can study the species um, further. So it requires us to build a machine learning algorithm. And we'll get to that. Um, so a little bit about um, how, how this would work. Um, so let's talk about how we record audio. Um, so we can do it in two ways. We can actively monitor and record sound by, by being physically present in the survey area. So here is a picture of someone and they're holding um, uh, a recorder on, on, on the right. And um, you'll see a little plug going in um, and attached is a shotgun microphone, um, also known as a directional microphone. And what this microphone does is it captures a lot of signal at um, whatever it's pointing at and everything perpendicular to the microphone is not as strongly captured. So if you have a lot of sound on the sound on the sides, um, that won't really be captured by the microphone and um, whatever is directly in front of it will primarily be captured. So this is a great way to, to get data because the person who's doing the recording can see the species that they're recording. So um, if you want to record birds um, and maybe you're not too sure of the sounds that they make, um, or, or maybe you're just an amateur birder, or you want to get into birding, um, you might not be able to recognize their sounds. So you might be recording data and thinking, oh, this is a particular bird, but, but you're wrong. Um, so a great way then is to visually see what you're recording and you can take a picture. And um, so this is a great way to collect accurate data because you can see exactly what you're recording and then you can be sure of um, what it is that you've recorded. Now, of course, there's one huge problem with this approach is that it's massively invasive. Um, you have a human that's in the environment that's next to the species. Um, if the species is, is critically endangered, um, um, that could be prob problematic for many reasons. Um, but also some animals will, will shy away very easily, um, especially birds, if you get too close. So it, it's highly invasive. So the alternative to this is passive acoustic monitoring. Um, and if you start reading a little bit about this, you'll see the abbreviation PAM. Um, and in, in passive acoustic monitoring, um, the human is not physically present in the um, environment. Um, we have a little device um, like this. So the one on the left is an audio moth. Um, and um, this is a, a waterproof case. Um, here is, um, um, I forgot the name. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular material that allows for sound to go through, but, but not water to go through. Um, and it's got three AA batteries in here, and it's got a, a micro SD card, and it can record data for many days. So you can attach it to a tree and then you can just leave the area and come back in, in two weeks. So it's highly non-invasive. So this is a, a great way to capture data. And this is how um, um, researchers actually go about capturing data. Um, especially you have to, to worry about additional things. For example, the um, environment might not allow you to be there for a long time. Uh, maybe it's a harsh environment. So you will trek for a few days, um, deploy your microphone, trek back, 
um, stay at a camp and then go again. Um, to give you a, a real world example, um, um, a, a PhD student that I'm working with um, was, well, actually still is in, in Madagascar right now. And um, she was um, collecting data for the black and white ref lemurs, which I'll talk about. Actually, there was a cyclone there um, last week. Um, and, and she said it would take roughly two weeks of effort to just go to the location where you deploy the microphone. Um, and, and because it's such an, a remote area, you might not be able to stay there for very long. So this kind of solution is, is great. On the right is, is a little bit more a, a sophisticated one. Um, so the one on the left is about $100. The one on the right um, is a, a few hundred dollars, maybe $400. Um, this is much more sophisticated. It has built-in GPS and uh, backup SD cards. Um, but I just want to give you an idea of, of how small this actually is. I actually have one with me right now. Um, so this is, I don't know if you can see my camera, but this is um, one of the wildlife acoustics. Um, it's the Song Meter Micro Mini. Um, so this is the waterproof case. Um, and if I open it up, um, and this is the inside. Uh, it's got, there we go. So you can see where the AAA batteries go in. Uh, the micro SD card goes in. Um, just here and there's a few little switches and and that's it and the microphone is actually on the side there again it's a, a waterproof uh, material um, that allows sound to go through uh, incredibly hard to get hold of this material um, um, you have to actually if, if you want to build one of these yourself which i started to work on um, because I was I was interested in developing real time uh, devices. Um, actually, very hard to get hold of this material. So if you do end up deciding you want to build your own, um, you have to be very patient with, with with the assembly of the device. Okay, so this is how we would do it in a, in a passive manner. So now that we have our hardware and we know how we are going to we're going to go somewhere and we're going to put our microphone somewhere. Um, um, how, how do we actually capture the audio? So the data is digitally recorded as raw amplitude values. And what that really just means is you can just think of a long sequence of numbers. So you, you've been learning about Python. You would have learned about um, arrays and lists. Um, so, so essentially, the data is recorded as just a, a long list of numbers. Um, and the amount of values that are recorded in, in one second is the, is the sampling rate. So we have to set the recorder to sampling rates. And I'll explain um, how what that means. So if we set our recorder, for example, to 9,000 Hertz, that means in one second of time, we capture 9,000 uh, raw values. Um, hi, I think someone's got their mic on. Can you just please mute that? Yeah, I just tried, yeah. Um, so, okay. So if we have our, our sampling rate as, as 9,000 Hertz, then in one second of time, we capture 9,000 data points. Uh, if we record for 10 seconds, that's 90,000 data points. Now, now the, the question is, how do we decide on this value? And it's, it's, it's not too difficult. There's a nice relationship. And it's got to do with the frequency at which the animal or, or species that you're interested in makes the vocalization. So for example, Elephant, the elephant rumble is 12 hertz. And bats call between 
uh, 9 to 200,000 hertz. And um, the, the relationship is, is as follows. Um, you set the sampling rate to be twice the frequency that the animal vocalizes at. So, for example, if you are interested in recording birds, um, birds, um, so this top chart shows um, some of the frequencies that birds vocalize at. So let's look at the robin, which is at the top. Um, the robin uh, will vocalize at around 8,000 hertz. So that means <clears throat> we need to set the sampling rate at least 16,000. And uh, this has got to do with the Nyquist theorem. So if, you, if you're interested in more details, you can just look online about the Nyquist theorem. And, and the Nyquist theorem basically states that we need to set um, the capturing device as twice the frequency uh, you're trying to capture. So if we're trying to capture um, um, uh, let's say the song thrush, which is around 2,500 hertz, um, which, which we would know from literature, for example. So if you're studying a species, maybe there's an academic paper about telling you what the frequencies are. So you would set your recorder to twice that amount. So if, it's, if it vocalizes at 2,500 hertz, you set the sampling rate on your device to be 5,000, at least 5,000. Now, you could say, well, um, what if I set it to a lot more? What if I set my, my device to 200,000? Because some of these little devices can go up to 300,000. You can do that. You, you will record the sound, but you will record a, a additional data, which is not necessary. If you're only interested in, in a particular species, you want to limit the frequency range that you're recording at. Recording at a higher frequency, all that does is it captures additional frequencies and it means that your files are much larger. Um, um, so instead of your file being 10 megabytes, it'll now be 50 megabytes. Um, and, and this scales significantly, um, especially when you're doing long surveys over multiple months, you wanna set the sampling rate um, correctly so that you don't um, need to frequently go to the device and change the memory card. So that's a little bit about um, how to figure out the sampling rate. And um, here is an idea of, of just um, frequency in general. So um, the, the human um, hearing um, is, is this bottom one where we can hear up to roughly um, 20,000 Hertz. Um, and um, as when for a normal person, well, uh, for, for a healthy human, let's say, let's, let's put it like that. Um, um, when you're young, you can hear uh, quite high and, and with time um, that decreases a little bit. Um, you might find that in certain shopping malls, you might hear a, a very high frequency sound. Um, sometimes they use that to prevent birds from coming in. Um, young people might hear it and, and older people might not hear it. So um, your, your hearing will change with time. Um, but um, so the birds are, are around in, in this region um, um, from the low frequencies all the way to about 8,000. Um, higher than 20,000 is ultrasounds. So, so what vocalizes here, it's primarily bats. So bats um, vocalize at very high frequencies. That means you need to set your, your device at a very high sampling rate. And there are certain animals that uh, vocalize in the uh, infrasound um, range as well. Um, um, a, a few primates actually vocalize in this. Um, and uh, we're actually going to start um, a few interesting studies with, with collaborators overseas who have just discovered um, that uh, a particular species is vocalizing here. And 
I think um, we did not know that before, but now since we have all these devices and we can record, we're actually able to discover new ways that animals uh, communicate. So this is a great way to study animal behavior as well in terms of communication. Okay, so now that we understand a little bit about the hardware and, and, how, and how data is stored, uh, the acoustic data, um, for the, the Heinen Gibbons, what we did, uh, the, the researchers placed um, certain microphones in certain known areas where the Gibbons um, were, were seen in this particular nature reserve. So uh, recorders were placed in, in various locations. And now we start recording for many months. Uh, it was about six months. And I think the, the devices recorded from about eight, no, probably a bit earlier, um, maybe five in the morning until the evening, um, every single day. So now we have a, a large amount of raw data. Um, and we have, let's say, 6,000 hours of data. Um, now, you know, I said before, it's very time consuming for a human to go through this. So can we use machine learning to automatically find these calls for us and essentially save us a lot of time? Um, so here are some examples of um, the spectrograms. So, so what a spectrogram is, is it allows us to convert the sequence of numbers into these visual pictures that has time on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. So this allows you to visualize the change of frequencies um, and, and makes it a little bit more easier for the human because um, the, the raw files is just a sequence of numbers. So our human eyes cannot see these patterns, but when we convert it to the spectrogram domain, um, we can see these patterns and it makes it, it makes it easier. So here is an example of a one pulse uh, given call. You can see um, this um, slightly um, lighter um, um, line here. And, and, and all this is just background noise, so background uh, environmental noise. Um, here is a, is a two pulse call. You can see the strong signal. So strong signals in, in a spectrogram will be brighter. Um, and here you can see a few signals here. This is probably some, some bird. Uh, here's an example of a three pass call. You can clearly see the three um, distinct um, pulses. And now the gibbons can vocalize uh, up to five or six pulses. Um, I think we have an encounter with, with seven pulses, which is more rare. And the other type of of call that the gibbons make is a duet. And this is when the male and the female sing together. Um, so you can see uh, a large amount of signal here. And here you can see distinct, these distinct pulses. Um, and this is when they, they sing together. And it's actually, it sounds quite nice. Um, so now the nice thing with this is we've we've converted this long string of numbers, which to the human uh, eye makes absolutely no sense, into these pictures, which start to make a lot of sense. Um, for example, I've just shown you these pictures. If I were to show you more pictures, you would very easily be able to tell me that's a gibbon call because um, our, our um, visual perception system um, and our, um, our brain um, is able to recognize these, these patterns and we can abstract quite easily. And, and later we'll learn about how we can build a machine learning algorithm to achieve this visual perception system that, uh, that we, ha we have as humans. So, but essentially now the problem becomes an image problem where it's about classifying pictures, um, which comes back to what I said originally at, at, at the start, where we want to, to, to have a classification problem and, and we want to see, is this, does this image contain uh, a two pulse call? 
does this image contain a duet call or does it contain something else? So, so that's what we, we would like. So um, how, do we, how do we build this data set? Because remember, we've got our 6,000 hours. Um, how, how do we start to build a data set so that we can use machine learning to, to learn to recognize these visual patterns? So unfortunately, um, the, the starting phase of such a project means that we need to listen to some of the data and to start to build a data set. So we can use um, um, software to visualize the spectrograms. Um, and actually, this is a nice picture because it shows you the raw audio. So this is just the raw amplitude values, which is stored um, as the original data. And um, it's just amplitude value. So the, the louder it is, you, you'll have a spike. And you can see that from this picture, you cannot tell what is a given call here. Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense. But when we convert it into a spectrogram, you now see all these patterns. And actually, um, you might be able to see here are some given pulses. Uh, here are some more given pulses. And here is one given pulse as well. Uh, and these, these uh, vertical lines, um, it could be it could be many things. It could be a drop of water that falls on the microphone. It could be um, a branch breaking. Um, there's, there's many sounds that produce these um, uh, high broadband um, um, frequencies. Um, um, and, and this could be um, some bird, uh, for example. So now what we can do is we can, we can listen to the sound and we can see the spectrogram at the same time. And we can now start to create a data set where we can annotate, we can draw little boxes around these sounds, which allows us to essentially create a, a data set to, to start building the, the algorithm. Um, this particular software is called Sonic Visualizer. It's uh, open source from uh, Queen Mary University in the UK. Um, I like it a lot uh, because when we draw the little boxes around the sounds, we can export the file and then we can use Python um, to read the file. So it's, it's actually very nice. There are proprietary software um, that have some of these classification things built in. But um, when you start to speak to ecologists, you'll see that um, they say that some of these tools are not very good. Um, and that's why they're turning to machine learning people to say, actually, can you help us build better models? And, and, and that's what we, we're going to talk about. OK, so now we will label our data. So we'll draw these little boxes around examples that contain the gibbon. So here you can see uh, a two pulse gibbon call. And here is a, here is a bird you, um, that's, that's doing some vocalizations in the background. Now, this is, this is, this is important. We don't want to only um, annotate examples where the species that you're interested in is present. Um, we also want to annotate examples where there is something else going on. So here is given absence. So, so it's, a, it's a binary problem. Um, does the section of audio contain a given call? Um, or does the section of audio not contain a given call? So this is the given presence, and this is the given absence. Um, I'm actually not sure what this particular species is, but um, when you listen to the audio, um, it's, it's really loud and, and painful, and you have to drop the volume quite a lot. Um, so this is actually quite painful to listen to. And this is how we build a binary data set. Um, we, we go and we spend some time, and we, we label, we listen, and we draw little boxes around um, examples that contain what you're interested in and the background 
examples where there are other animals um, um, vocalizing at the same time, so spending time in annotating additional non-presence examples is important, um, such as birds, other sounds in your environment. Um, now environments change. Certain environments have particular um, environmental noise. Um, in, say, for example, environmental noise um, in one city might be different to another city, or environmental noise in, in one nature reserve might be different to another. Um, so trying to capture as much of the environmental noise will help to reduce the amount of false positives. Um, so what, what a false positive is, is when the algorithm says, I saw, I heard a gibbon, but actually it wasn't. And, and that's quite painful um, when we have many false positives, because then the human actually spends a lot of time just um, um, not getting data that they need. So we need to try and minimize false positives to be beneficial to uh, a conservation ecologist to actually use this tool. Um, so this is a nice little picture um, that will be featured in a few, I, th um, I think it's next month. Um, it, it'll be featured at the International Day of Mathematics. Um, we have a little um, uh, publication with UNESCO for the International Day of Mathematics, and they made this nice picture for me. And, and it illustrates all this, the, the main steps where we have our passive acoustic recorder um, and it records this raw data, which makes no sense to the human. Then we apply a, a technique to get the spectrograms. Now the spectrograms makes a lot of sense to us. And then we can use deep learning um, to classify these spectrograms to help us find um, th these things. Now, we'll talk about deep learning um, later on um, next week, um, but maybe I'll just give you a little, um, a little insight. Um, so why deep learning? Um, so um, it turns out that progress in, in deep learning um, achieves state-of-the-art performance when it comes to image problems. When we're trying to find things in image, uh, deep learning algorithms is, is the, the most um, optimal and state-of-the-art approach. Um, previously, uh, researchers would use uh, traditional machine learning techniques like uh, decision trees, random forest, but now um, it's, it's clear from academic literature and from, from industry as well, that deep learning is the most optimal approach. And this is why um, we end up using it, but we'll, we'll get to that next week. So uh, I just want to share a little bit about um, projects that we're working on. Um, so in, in Madagascar, uh, there's the black and white reft uh, lemurs. Uh, so here you'll see I wrote CR uh, because this species is um, critically endangered. Um, and it, it was collected by uh, some researchers from uh, City University of New York Graduate Center. And here is um, an example of uh, the black and white reft uh, lemma vocalization events. So actually, um it is a lot less obvious than the gibbon cause the gibbon cause you could clearly see the pulses this one is actually very hard to um to detect especially if you have a lot of other background environmental noise um so this is one of the projects that we're, we're working quite actively on um in malawi uh, we are working with uh, researchers from uh, BINCO, which is a nonprofit organization in Belgium, and uh, Malawi University of Science and Technology. Um, and uh, we have a nice data set of the Theolo Alithi. Here in brackets, I wrote uh, VU, which means it's a vulnerable species. 
Um, and here you can see the vocalizations of the uh, theolo. It's, it's like a, a flipped tick mark. It's just in the other direction. So, so this one is a lot easier to, to visually see compared to this uh, Lima call, which is uh, actually very hard. It, it, it doesn't have a lot of structure, but this one has a lot of structure. Um, and then um, I'm working with uh, a, a team in, in Botswana uh, for the spotted hyena. Here in brackets, I wrote LC, which means least concern. So it, it's not endangered. Um, and this is an interesting work. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, here, the researchers are from University of Botswana and University of New South Wales in um, uh, Australia. Um, and here are some uh, vocalization events of the spotted um, hyena. Again, a, a lot of structure, quite easy to, to detect um, for humans. So now, um, uh, for this one, I said we only had 12 files that were manually labeled. So we had 12 files that we manually verified, which means we didn't have a lot of data. So now the, the next question is, can we produce useful models if we have very little data? Um, why, why is this important? Um, and it's important because um, if the species you're interested in is endangered, you might not capture a lot of audio um, examples for that species. Additionally, the area that you might be surveying might be very difficult to access. It might require you to go on a hike for several weeks in very harsh um, environments. So sometimes um, we don't have a lot of data. Um, to give you a more extreme example, um, on Hainan Island, uh, there, is a, there is a peacock called the, the Hainan pheasant peacock, um, for which the population status is unknown. Um, people are not sure as to how many individuals of this peacock exist and are still alive. And there are only three examples on the internet that you can find for this uh, peacock. So can we build a machine learning model with only three examples? Um, and, and, and normally people would say, no, that's an, an outrageous thing to think of. But um, this is an area of research that I'm very passionate about, um, because this is where the real challenge comes in, is can we build useful models if we just have just a few examples? Um, so, so two of my students who uh, from the University of Rwanda um, have been exploring this a little bit. Um, so I live very close to this nature reserve in Cape Town. Uh, this is the Intaka Island Nature Reserve in, in Century City. And what we did is we placed um, a microphone and we, we started recording data for um, two birds, two um, least concerned birds, so not at all endangered. But what we did is we, we deliberately sampled from our examples. So we pretended that all we had was very few examples. And then we tried to build um, machine learning algorithms. Um, and, and, two, and these two students explored different machine learning um, techniques to try to get around um, this problem. So I just want to share um, a little something with you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm busy writing a paper which will which will answer this question, and, and hopefully uh, it will be published soon. Um, here you can see um, this is uh, the, the lemurs data, and here we, we built a model on only 50 examples. And here you can see that if we use transfer learning, which is a particular type of a deep learning technique, which we'll, we'll touch on next week, we, we can build models that achieve up to um, roughly 85% um, F1 score. Uh, 
and I haven't defined what F1 score is, it's a measure of accuracy. You, you can just take it as a measure of accuracy. And on the right, um, these are just randomly initialized neural network models. Um, and essentially the, the point that I'm conveying here is with smart techniques in deep learning, we can build models that achieve quite good performance on, on just 50 examples. And what does this what does this mean? If you are conducting an acoustic survey, for example, with uh, what, what we did with the uh, hyenas in Botswana, is we, we collected uh, all this data, and then we wanted to use machine learning to help us. So what we, we started labeling a few examples, for example, 25. And then we said, OK, now we will stop the human effort and we will build a model on these 25 examples. And then we'll get the algorithm to find new ones for us. Now, of course, there'll be some mistakes, but there'll be some correct ones as well. Now, we take the correct ones and we feed it back into the model. We train it again, and now it finds new examples and it will make some mistakes. Um, we take the new ones that are correctly found and we feed it back in the model. And this semi-supervised approach significantly boosts the amount of human time that needs to be invested in going through the uh, original data. So this is um, a very nice area and it, it will drastically improve um, the amount of time wasted on annotating. Um, so a lot of researchers do this manually and they waste months and months of time just annotating data. And um, we're hoping with this new paper to convince people that using particular techniques, um, it can drastically boost this time. So that means that less expert time um, is spent on, on doing data analysis and the experts can now work on ecological uh, implications, studying behaviors, and, and so on. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about my personal views of the future of machine learning for passive acoustic monitoring. And um, my view on this is that um, we're going to go heavily towards the area of, of real-time analysis using these little devices that, that uh, we can buy. Um, so for example, this is a, a Raspberry Pi. Um, um, I think this is a newer model. I'm actually not sure, but um, the, yeah, this actually is the new model. Uh, and the new models have up to eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, which might not sound like a lot, um, but it allows us to build more complex machine learning algorithms that we can put out in the field to do real analysis. Um, um, and here's an example of, of something I've been playing around with. There's a little Raspberry Pi and my microphone, and, and this is uh, just um, downstairs from, from where I live. And, and I, I was seeing if, if we could uh, do real-time analysis of, of some birds that are in, in the neighborhood. And so this is, I think, where we're heading. Um, but it's not as trivial as just saying, let's take the best machine learning algorithm, put it on a Raspberry Pi, and, and, and we're done. Um, there's this, this itself opens many PhD projects, many avenues for postdocs, and, and, uh, and many years of research um, in, in compression, in, in machine learning compression, which is, big, which is quite a hot topic. Can we compress these very complicated machine learning algorithms? Can we make them smaller, but efficient? Can we compress the data transmission? So uh, when we uh, make some predictions in real time, we might want to send the data back to a server so that the human can check that the model is, is still doing a good job. Um, but perhaps the location that this device is doesn't have 3G, 4G, 
uh, Ethernet, and you know, it doesn't have any strong network. Maybe it has a very weak network. Maybe it, it has LoRa, so satellite uh, or, or satellite communication. In, in such instances, you cannot transmit one gigabyte of data. You can transmit maybe half a megabyte of data. So now this, this results in extreme data compression. And there's lots of mathematical techniques that are, that, uh, are, are suitable to explore. So um, I think this is a great area to, to, to work in and um, it can make significant impacts. Um, now I wanna share something. Um, so, so I posted this tweet, um, um, when was it? In February, 2021. Um, and, and, and from this tweet alone um, is how I've actually come across so many interesting people who, who wanted help. Um, and this comes to the original statement I, I made um, when I introduced myself that um, there, there are machine learning people and then they're, they're ecologists, um, but, but there's a bridge to gap. Um, and, and by reaching out um, to people, um, they will be very willing to share data with you and, and, and they might be doing it manually and you can help them drastically. Um, so actually nearly all of my collaborations have come from, from Twitter, just reaching out to people. Um, the, the community is actually very friendly. Um, so I think that ecologists and mathematicians and mis machine learning people, statisticians, um, we can actually all work together to produce um, very good models to help with, with conservation ecology. So, so what is the take home message from all of this? Um, so I think that combining efforts of people from, from multiple skill sets can drastically um, help um, with the SOS I talked about um, to help uh, um, the, the decline in biodiversity. Um, but another very important thing, which is, which is challenging for us researchers at, at times is, um, is not to stop at a publication. Um, you, you publish your work, but then you want to try and engage with policymakers based on the tool you've made or the algorithm you've made to try and implement this in, in, in the real world. And, 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 and this is not trivial because policymakers might not understand some of these things, um, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, and, and, and the biggest take home message is actually everyone can help. And, and everyone can help um, using websites like Zenocanto, for example, and there are other websites like iNaturalist, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm a sound guy, so, so Zenocanto makes sense to me. Um, so what Zenocanto is, it's, it's a website where people upload uh, vocalizations of birds. So it's just for birds, and um, you go out with your, your equipment, um, so of course, um, depending on how much you invest in, in, in this, you can go out with something like this, which is a, a, a expensive, a fancy recorder, but um, you can also just go out with your cell phone and, and you, can, you can record sounds. Um, maybe you know what a particular bird is, you, you can recognize it. And then you just take your microphone and you record some sounds and then you can upload it to the website. And this allows us to have data sets where people have, have verified that the audio contains the sound and it allows us to build more robust machine learning algorithms. Um, now, in particular, here's an example of why I think more people need to work on this. So, so I'm in Cape Town. Um, and the, the gray heron is um, quite a common species in Cape Town, um, especially in Century City because of the, the nature reserve. Um, but it turns out that nobody in Cape Town has uploaded a recording of the gray heron. Um, some of the there was someone in Johannesburg, 
um, some people here, um, nobody in Cape Town. So I just went and spent some time at the nature reserve and, and started recording vocalizations of the gray heron and essentially contributing to researchers who might be interested in building um, or studying the species. So the, the real take home message is actually everyone can help play a significant role um, in enabling machine learning people um, and, and ecologists to actually build better models to, to help um, with conservation. Okay, so, so that, is, that is it for this presentation. Uh, let's see, it's 10 o'clock. Um, I don't know if everyone wants a one or two minutes break, and then um, I would like to move on to the next series for a few, which I'll do for a few days, which will be teaching you about machine learning. Emmanuel, should we give uh, the participants an opportunity to ask questions? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> because of I course. see there, there were a few in, in, in the chat, but, uh, uh, but maybe to make it as interactive as possible, people can just unmute themselves and ask you in person. Yeah, we don't right. need to do it all through an intermediary. Yeah. So, Eric, I see raise his hand. Please, Eric, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for such a Wonderful presentation, very insightful, um, very informative. Um, I just have a question. Um, I, I imagine the, the whole idea of, of these studies is to understand the behavior of animals. Um, and, and in your case, you are just uh, taking recording audios. But do, do, do you have um, um, corresponding videos uh, when you record? Because I can imagine you just listen to an audio but there's no uh, video would, would the study or would you understand the behavior of the animals um, completely if there's no you know, corresponding video to, to accompany the audio? Thank you. That's a, that's a great um, question. Um, so most passive acoustic monitoring studies will just have sound because um, the ecologist studying the animal will be an expert in the sound. So they will know exactly what it sounds like and a video might not contribute much to them. Um, but but to, to answer your question, um, yes. So one of my students, um, a new, a new student, actually, um, a master's student, is, is, is using a, a tool called Deep Lab Cut, which um, is a very mature pose estimation tool for animals. So one area in machine learning is called pose estimation, and um, it's frequently used for human pose. So human pose estimation, where we have a video and we want to be able to, to uh, have an algorithm that can recognize the body structure, the, the skeleton, like where is the head, where, where, where is the arms? So we, we have a model of, of the skeleton of the human. So, so this is very popular for humans, but um, there's a group of researchers who have made a, a wonderful tool to do animal pose estimations where we can study animals. Um, so um, some of the students, uh, some of my students and collaborators, we are building uh, dual models where we study the posture and the pose and the acoustics simultaneously. Um, and this is a very new, area let's let's say it's it's very new um there's very few publications so it's a very exciting field to be in and, and to play around in um so, so to answer your question um some researchers might record video some might not um, um and, and the reason for the might not is because we're only recently having the ability to do animal 
behavior analysis via videos. So I think uh, probably in two years, we will see many publications on this. Um, um, so it's an exciting area to, to try and to, to explore. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. In the, in the chat, there's a question by Joseph. Uh, Joseph, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, thank you, Manuel. It's a nice talk, uh, an interesting one. But my question is, uh, among the voices or the frequencies that you're going to record, uh, they come from different uh, animals. Uh, for example, if you are looking at the gibbon, there could be birds. For example, you've given us the raindrop. How, how effective uh, are you able to identify? Or how, or how, what uh, technique will you be using to identify the different uh, frequencies? Like I gave an example of the cocktail party problem where there are so many voices, and then you want to narrow down to just one. Do you apply such techniques to the same problem? So most papers will not um, do that. Um, most papers will narrow down the frequency band that you're interested in. So if you know that your species vocalizes between a particular a low frequency and a particular high frequency, you can narrow down your, your window to focus on that. And to overcome the, the cocktail problem, you can augment your data set. So um, if you have a, a, an example of a given vocalization and you have many examples of birds, you can um, do a linear combination so you can say W1, X1, W2, X2, where X1 would be the gibbon and X2 would be the bird. And then you can attach a, a linear combination and you can overlay them together. So you can create synthetic data where you deliberately have all these other sounds happening at the same time to train the algorithm to become better at, um, at so-called decomposing. Um, so, so augmentation helps to address this problem. Um, um, I haven't seen a lot of studies that try to do some kind of uh, decomposition to uh, avoid this. Um, it's mainly via augmentation and creating synthetic examples. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Emmanuel, um, Benjamin uh, is raising his hand. Benjamin, would you like to go ahead? And then there is... Uh, Yes, sir. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I worked with spectrograms for many years, uh, so it was all for different applications. So it was very interesting to see your approach. So I think the previous speaker actually answered, but I wanted to know if you needed to pre-process your data with like a bandpass filter, maybe to remove un any unwanted noise or focus on a specific region. Uh, yeah. Y yes. Um, I, I didn't want to to dive into that too much because then it gets uh, very technical but essentially yes um, um, uh, for example with the gibbons uh, the the maximum frequency is, is 2000 hertz so what we would do is we would apply a low pass filter and what a low pass filter for everyone else is is we, we ignore high frequencies and in doing so, when we downsample the audio files, so, so downsampling is another pre-processing technique that we use um, to completely eliminate the high frequencies. When we do them together, we can avoid artifacts that, uh, that emerge from the downsampling pre-processing. And, and um, to give you an idea of what I mean by artifacts is, um, if you simply downsample your file, which, which means like uh, eliminating the high frequencies, um, vo a vocalization signal towards the, the high end of the spectrogram can, can actually invert. So it's an, an artifact. And, and one way to overcome this is by applying a, a low pass filter. Um, so, so yes, uh, we do do a, um, low pass filtering and downsampling to eliminate high frequencies. And, and I guess you would do the inverse for, for 
for bats because bats vocalize at high frequencies. So then you would do a high pass filter um, to eliminate all the, the low frequencies. Um, or, or you could do band pass filters and focus specifically on the region that you're interested in. So there's all these things that um, you can do, yeah. Thank you for that. I have just one more question. Um, just for the real-time analysis, you mentioned on Raspberry Pi, where ML is quite um, you know, intensive. Did you possibly consider using maybe a simpler like statistics model, like a linear regression to recognize the patterns um, on the spectrogram? Because the profiles seem quite distinct um, that you showed. Um, maybe it would work for um, a species that has a very structured core. Um, for species that have completely unstructured cores and there's very little consistency, I, I think um, deep learning models will still outperform. Um, there are some papers that uh, I think compare these techniques and um, definitely deep neural networks outperform um, more simpler statistical techniques. Um, but in terms of the Raspberry Pis, um, one would be surprised as to actually what kind of models they can actually use. Um, I, I've put quite a few models on the Raspberry Pis and it works well. Um, even on the older Model 3, where you only had one gigabyte of RAM, um, um, but, but, but model compression would, would still be a, a great thing to do. Um, but, but so to directly answer your question, um, um, for, for more robust results, deep learning would be most optimal, um, especially if, if the cores are like the ref lemurs where it's uh, a bit more unstructured and, and, and more complex. Um, I see there's uh, Matt is raising his hand. Matt, uh, you're most welcome to ask your question to Emmanuel. Yeah, um, thanks for the great presentation, Emmanuel. It's very exciting things you're working on. I was just wondering, in terms of the deep models you're working with, like you mentioned that uh, the image data is obviously suited nicely for the deep learning. And I was wondering if uh, other kind of formats of data is also used in uh, conjunction with these models. So. Yeah, having like a two-dimensional data set. Uh, if, if you take characteristics of the pure raw audio files, like the, I know they do these malfrequency perceptual coefficients for speed recognition and zero crossing rate type of thing. So if you use just the image data as pixels, or if it's the pixel data and also some other type of variables that you include. Okay, so that's a great question. Um... So um, there are some studies that have compared the MFCCs that you've spoken about and different types of um, um, in inputs. Um, off the top of my head, I, I, I can't remember them all right now. And the, the spectrogram produces the most optimal results. Um, now, something I can share with, with everyone. Um, so so the, 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 the paper I, I'm hoping to submit soon, shows that we can actually optimize the spectrogram by doing some tricks. We can actually squeeze more performance, which suggests that um, spending efforts in exploring how to optimize these inputs um, would, would be useful. And in other area of research, I found this um, to emerge as well, where for example, in, in, in facial recognition, um, there have been some studies that show that we can manipulate the, the image space somehow and squeeze extra performance out of it. So I, so, so nobody has really worked on this yet. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to, to convince people to work on this. Um, and I have a student who is not taking MFCCs like, like you've described, which is uh, manipulating the, the audio data to, to get statistical measures but instead to use just simple metadata from the file. For example, time of day um, so via a multi-branch neural network that, that reads in the spectrogram and reads in the time of day. So why is this useful? Um, so my hypothesis is that um, 
unless if there is significant background noise, a CNN or a neural network, or let's just call it machine learning because I haven't formally defined it for everyone. A machine learning algorithm might not be able to distinguish between night and day, unless if there is intense background conditions that the model can learn when, when there's this, it's night, and when, there's, when this is day. But let's assume that there's no significant change in background condition. Um, the gibbons vocalize mainly in the morning until around midday. But uh, the machine learning algorithm has no idea how to learn this relationship. So, so I have a student who is exploring how can we incorporate time of day to, to reduce false positives because it's highly unlikely that a gibbon will call at two in the morning. Uh, further to that, um, I hypothesize that we can learn locational information. So um, a particular type of bird might uh, sound very similar to another bird, but based on the in location, geographic location, you can tell the difference. But without the geographic location, you cannot tell the difference. So I hypothesize that research in text, in, in natural language processing, we can take what we've learned and, and incorporate it into audio space. Because in, in text, they've built these great models that learn relationships in high dimensional space between words. So why don't we learn relationships in, in geographic locations and learn um, n-dimensional relationships. And, and I think that combining all of these things will produce really good models. So I think that you know, future research will show that um, combining all these different things will produce great models. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I also think that <clears throat> if the direction of the deep learning things, you know, over parameterization isn't necessarily a bad thing anymore so more more information you can include uh the better so yeah no. uh, thanks for your answer uh, thank you very much matt for the question i think there is a question in the um ah <laughs> someone asked emmanuel please check your chat and i don't know if someone sent you a private message um, because i don't see anything uh, um, Oh, okay, so someone asked if I covered uh, back propagation. Ah, no. okay. So, so, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the the next part um, uh, with me for the next uh, for the next two weeks will be introduction to to machine learning and to neural networks, where um, I will cover some of these things. Uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I, I won't cover back propagation for the very simple reason that. Um, I don't want to overwhelm everyone um, because it, what I will share is overwhelming. So I don't want to exceed the overwhelming effect of introducing machine learning because there's so many things. Um, I don't want to overload everyone. So we'll, we'll slowly get there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And maybe. Uh, I see it's already 20 past 10. Maybe it's not the right time to start something new. Maybe, maybe we yeah. should uh, use your, your last comments on the preview of what will you, you will do in the next lectures uh, as the kind of uh, summary of, 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 of today's first lecture. And I just checked in the program. I think the next lecture of Emmanuel is on Thursday morning. So please join us again Thursday morning, uh, but don't forget to join us this afternoon because at two we have uh, the first lecture of the course on, of statistic, um, statistics methods using R. So this is just a little bit of an uh, outlier <laughs> because uh, we introduce it to R and we don't do only Python, but that I guess is probably a good thing. Yeah. So uh, Emmanuel, uh, sorry, let me just see if there's another message in the chat. Ah, sorry, this is just uh, the, 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 um, the encouragement of Benjamin to use the Slack channel. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for that. Um, so, Emmanuel, thank you very much again for, for the really very nice uh, introduction to this exciting uh, topic. And uh, you heard the many questions. I'm sure everybody will be very, is very keen to, to see how the story evolves 
over the next couple of uh, 10 days or so. Yeah. So Emmanuel, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, and we will see you on Thursday, but I will see all the other participants at two this afternoon. <laughs> You're welcome to join us as well, Emmanuel, if you want to learn right, some thank of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a thank good day, you. everyone. Bye. Bye, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.